Hello and welcome to this uh, lunchtime symposium for the DE Research Symposium. My name is Weston Baxter. I'm a lecturer in design engineering here. Uh, my own work specializes around behavioral science and design, specifically looking at things like design for behavior change. And we're going to be joined with us, um, several panelists. But before we do that, we have a brief teaser video to highlight some of the research going on in design engineering. So design engineering, we have gone in the last five or six years from two academics to more than 20 academics. And along with that comes dramatic changes in both the research and practice of what we see design engineering to be. Um, so today is gonna to be an exciting opportunity to reflect on that a bit with, with several academic, several members of the academic team. Um, so I'll welcome them on now um, and allow each of them to introduce themselves. Uh, so Nera, could we start with you? and a brief introduction of yourself. Thank you, Weston. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Neera Van Zalk. I'm a lecturer um, in psychology and human factors, in fact. Um, I had the design psychology lab within the school, and my research focuses on understanding various psychological mechanisms that govern kind of human behavior and our emotions, our decision-making processes related to design. Thank you, Nera. Billy, could I have you introduce yourself, please? Yep. Uh, my name is Dr. Billy Wu. I'm a senior lecturer in design engineering, and my research focuses on low carbon energy technologies. So things like electric vehicles and uh, large scale batteries to help us meet our net zero targets to reduce emissions. Thank you, Billy. And Celine? Hi everyone, my name is uh, Céline Mougenot. I'm a senior lecturer in design engineering and I, um, my research interests are in collaborative design. I particularly look at how uh, innovators um, and, and people design and create innovations and, and in particular across disciplines and across cultures. Thank you, Celine. And I just want to say a, a brief um, excuse for, for Bob Shorten. He sends his apologies. He's hoping to join a little bit later, but Professor Bob Shorten um, works on cyber physical systems. And if he's able to join later, we'll have him introduce himself. Uh, so just to get started, Billy, I wanted to start with a question for you. Um, you know, you've been part of the department essentially since it started. And in that time, lots of changes have happened. And I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, you know, how you think the research and culture, uh, the research practice or, or the research vision and the research culture has changed over that time. Sure. Um, so design engineering, I would classify ourselves as a bit of a startup department. Uh, I had the, uh, the fortune of starting uh, at the very beginning. And I would say we've grown from strength to strength. Uh, which is aided by the new people we've kind of brought. So this panel, we've got designers, psychologists, engineers all kind of coming together. And I think that really uh, synthesizes and benefits the research that we, we do. It is very multidisciplinary as we add more and more people, new ideas kind of do get generated. I think our facilities um, also have improved dramatically. When we first started, we have this uh, very small building, 10 Princes Gardens for people who remember. And now we're in this very lovely, uh, uh, building which allows us to extend our research capabilities and I think that startup nature has built resilience in our research uh, as we look towards the future with grand challenges so in my area of research we're starting to look at how can we solve the big problems around climate change and that will involve human factors psychologists engineers coming together thanks Billy um, and, and some of the changes that we've had go beyond the department as well Nera I know you've been uh, leading a new college-wide initiative, um, looking at a network of people who work on human behavior um, and experience. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how maybe that came out of some discussions within the department. 
All right, so starting at Imperial, uh, you might get the wrong impression that we're only surrounded by people in laboratories and it's all very STEM science focused, and which it is, and it's a fantastic uh, STEM-based university. But in design engineering and many other departments, there are people who are interested in solving, like Billy said, some of the most pressing issues uh, that are coming up, things like sustainability or understanding of people and how they fit into sort of broader socio-technical systems and whatever research you do at the end of the day it will boil down to concerning people and so when i came to the department and having had discussions with you and many other colleagues it became um, apparent that there was a need to come together over a research network uh, and to think about how can some of these problems be solved. So um, together we started HubX, which stands for Human Behavior and Experience, a network of excellence funded by the college. And we bring together leading co uh, academics across the college, uh, anyone who basically focuses on um, trying to further frontier research uh, to do with human behavior or, or to do with human experience on some levels. Um, and again, um, human-centric research is more common at the college than one would first assume. And and how, how big is that network now? Just to give us an idea of the people. I believe we are now around uh, 70 active affiliated members. Um, we also hold various um, events and invite everyone these are typically open um so there are postdocs and phd students undergraduate students researchers senior academics uh anyone who's interested um can can join or just partake in, in some of our events great and celine there's a strong design group within the department uh with several different academics in it i wonder if you could talk a bit about the design research what that is um and and what kind of research you do and maybe some of the other members of that group sure uh, so design research i think is as it was uh, mentioned earlier is uh, is key in bridging uh the engineering and, and technological world with the real world, which is made of people in, in real life contexts. Uh, so I think the point of doing well design, design practice, but uh, design research is really to uh, make these worlds um, better connected and, and facilitate the conversation between uh, engineers, uh, scientists and, and, uh, and the real world people, the users, citizens and, and broader communities. Um, so the design research group in the school is looking at, at how to uh, bridge these two walls and, and create tools and methods and, and even uh, theoretical frameworks uh, that, can, that can actually uh, connect these two. Uh, so uh, there would be, as uh, perhaps uh, well, all of you have experienced, there might be sometimes difficulties in understanding each other. We're using different vocabularies, different uh, theories, uh, different, um, yeah, science, uh, science frameworks, and and we have to actually work together to uh, to create really useful innovation that can be put in the real world. So this is what we're trying to do in the in the design research group. Also, uh, trying to uh, uh, better communicate all together across uh, disciplines. So uh, someone uh, like Nira coming from psychology uh, will have to talk to someone like Billy in uh, hardcore engineering. And uh, well, obviously it's not the same language, not the same uh, theories that are used in, in, in both disciplines. And, uh, and the point of um, uh, design research is to really connect these two. Uh, so what we're doing, examples of projects are around uh, connecting, well, the, uh, the designers um, for people like Billy creating uh, technological innovations uh, with, uh, with the users, uh, the potential users of these innovations. So for instance, looking at how um, new batteries uh, can be put in the real world and can fit in a real life context. So we look at uh, how to, we, we try to understand better uh, real life context, users, how users will perceive innovations, how users will interact with innovations. 
and, and we create tools and methods that can uh, improve these processes. Um, so uh, and perhaps Weston, you may want to talk more about what you're doing, but uh, there are things about uh, work on uh, creating um, rituals for changing behaviors. Um, um, we have colleagues working on uh, um, co-designing healthcare systems with patients and GPs as well together. So creating uh, processes that can facilitate collaboration between uh, the end users and, and, uh, and other professionals. Uh, I'm looking at the process of designing. So I aim at creating tools uh, that can improve the way we imagine and, and prototype and make innovations. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I, in that, Celine, you were hitting on kind of bridging these gaps quite a bit. And, and Nero, with you here, I think this is an opportunity to get some of your thoughts. You know, design has for a long time been um, bridging the gap with psychology in various ways, but I think there's still a long way to go. I wonder in your perspective, what does psychology as a discipline, uh, what can psychology learn from design? And similarly, what what can design learn from psychology? Um, so I think obviously both design and psychology, I would say design engineering at large are you know concerned with human beings at the end of the day. But you know, we we come at it from different perspectives. If we look at the sort of traditional core, which was ergonomics and human factors, that was traditionally, you know, engineers who were concerned with the physical well-being of humans. Um, I also believe that we should be concerned with mental well-being of human beings who are using products and innovations in different ways. Um, so it's basically coming together from different perspectives, but for the same goal. I think what design engineers can learn from psychologists is probably um, a greater understanding of human beings from a psychological point of view. So we can try and explain why people behave certain ways individually or in groups, um, how we can change behavior, uh, how we can influence for the better. Uh, we can have more, uh, I think design engineers can gain more um, precision and measurement of human behavior because behavior and emotion analytics are obviously uh, something that psychologists are pretty obsessed about. Um, Myself, just from my own perspective, I've learned so much from being at the design engineering department. I believe that psychologists have a lot to learn from engineers. First of all, engineers are and designers are all very comfortable with the, this iterative process of, of creation, which I just find fantastic. Uh, and also I think design thinking is very important um, that it could easily be applied to research and it could be applied to basically anything. Um, application through technological innovation, I think there's a, a lot of the time psychologists are a little bit bad at engaging with technological innovation because we'd like to think that we stand outside of all of that. And I think psychologists should be directly involved because we do have things to say. And of course, design engineering at large, I think, has this fantastic entrepreneurial spirit, which I think certainly that that psychologists could could learn more from so i think we have a lot to learn and a lot to share and i think that's definitely happening within the department and i and i actually noticed that when there is a will despite like what celine was saying sometimes we don't have shared language but then when there's a will there's a way and i don't find it particularly difficult to talk to engineers there's a lot of similar thinking that that is shared that we just have to we just have to find um you know, get into the jargon, basically. Yeah, I think that's a, I, th I think that's a really um, rich reflection and a rich set of things that, that everybody can be learning. And, and Billy, it makes me want to come to you for a question, which is that you, you know, you work in a space that, and, and have really strong collaborations with people across college and, you know, certainly in, in other universities that are working maybe in engineering uh, capacities. But how has been how has your presence in design engineering made you think differently about the type of work that you are pursuing? No, it's a really good question, and um, I want to go back to some earlier points that Celine and Nero mentioned that we are very multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. and with a lot of the technological solutions that we're developing, they're great on paper, but if people aren't going to use them in the way we envisage, then the impact that we're creating, which is ultimately the output that we want, so. 
um, a greener planet, healthier living, then um, it's not as effective as it could be. So we need to uh, factor in all of these elements together. So I think design engineering as a discipline allows us to bridge those gaps. So in my field with electric vehicles, um, we, we've already had some elements of that. We, we often talk about range anxiety where pe basically uh, people are worried about how far their electric vehicles go. And when I talk to Nero, she's like, anxiety, I love it. <laughs> Let's talk about that and how we can solve these issues uh, because some of them are um, perceptual uh, aspects that the technology has improved, but people still think that there's a problem with the technology. So how can we overcome this? And in terms of how some of our researchers benefit from the culture we're creating, I think uh, we are a startup department which uh, poses certain challenges around the frameworks that we're creating haven't necessarily been there. But I think we should also see that as an opportunity that we can change how we do research moving forward, that research is great, but it also has certain inefficiencies and we've got the chance to change that. So I think it builds resilience in our researchers because we produce research, but actually one of our major outputs is also researchers and engineers and scientists and designers who actually go out into the world and create these fantastic solutions. Yeah, and then, so there's two questions I have building on that. Um, so maybe we, we start with the first, which corresponds to Peter's comment um, that I see here. So Peter Mandino says, uh, do, you see a, um, do you see a role for the Dyson School to act as brokers or catalysts in stimulating interdisciplinary collaboration across the Imperial network and beyond? Nera, I guess this comes back to your um, you know, HubX network that you, you have started at, across the college. But specifically, you know, and I'll throw this to the panel, but maybe Nera, starting with you, do we think that the Dyson School specifically has a, a role to play here to facilitate these kinds of interdisciplinary discussions beyond the department? Well, I think so. Uh, and I think that's because simply, uh, you know, like I said, human centric uh, research and design thinking is just kind of readily built into design engineering. And so it comes perhaps easier to us than it would in other places. Uh, but I think there is a will uh, to raise the profile of kind of human centric research across the college, um, simply because, like I said, so many of the grand challenges that we are seeing uh, will at the end of the day have to be applied in a human context. I can't think of any of the grand industrial challenges uh, that are not going to involve some level of you know, engaging with with end users or trying to change their behavior, or like Billy said, trying to make them understand that the the you know that the innovation is already there. Don't be anxious, etc. Um, so I think um, de design engineering can help build that community, and we can you know help uh, we can be the sort of focal point of of design centric thinking. But of course, I think the entire college um, is 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 got aspects of of human centric thinking so it's not as as weird as one might think um it's not non-existent let's put it that way yeah uh, celine or or billy any any other thoughts on this uh, yes i'd like to add uh well that um i'm fully in line with what nira explained and actually this relates to the complexity of uh issues we're addressing now um um, in the, the contemporary um, uh, issues that we're aiming at uh, addressing. So um, none of these issues are uh, just limited to engineering and we, we cannot just uh, provide a, a technical solution without having a look at the, the, the whole issue in, in its social context and looking at uh, human behaviors and looking at uh, uh, economical, uh, sociological, psychological aspects of the issue we're, we're addressing. So let's say if it's about, um, uh, there's no point of just redesigning a car if we're not looking at uh, mobility in general and in, in a given context. Uh, so in a given, in a given uh, country, in a given culture, uh, looking at um, the, the culture of the people and their, their values and their, their habits, uh, their psychological profiles and so on. So um, if we really want to create um, impactful innovations that uh, really fully address uh, contemporary issues, we need to have this 
holistic approach uh, that is design engineering approach, not just looking at um, the technical or engineering aspects of um, a system we're creating. Yeah, uh, you know, thanks so much for that. And, and one thing that this also brings up is that with typical engineering, we often think about engineering analysis, but with uh, you know design engineering, often one of the key challenges is also synthesis. You know, how do we bring different thoughts from different disciplines together and find where those can speak to each other? Um, Celine, I wonder maybe coming back to you on this especially from a student perspective, I mean, certainly from a, a staff research perspective, but also from a PhD student perspective, what do students need to be able to do uh, to effectively also synthesize information from different disciplines? And what makes a good PhD student in that regard? Uh, well, I think um, what is key is the ability to go beyond um, one's own discipline and, and uh, be able to look at what other um, other people in other disciplines are doing. So, so again, we're, we're talking a lot uh, today about multidisciplinary approach, and I think this is key in design engineering. This is uh, what really we're trying to do and what we're trying to, um, to, to um, cultivate uh, in, in the school, this uh, multidisciplinary approach where um, we expect um, us and, and our students and PhD students and also well, undergraduate students to be able to look at um, other disciplines and, and go beyond just the uh, traditional boundaries and traditional disciplines. So, um, uh, yeah, of course, we're like, we expect um, our students to to have these uh, skills in, in engineering, for instance, but we want them to go beyond that and uh, and, and tap into other, um, other disciplines in terms of methods and approaches. And for instance, we, um, we often recommend our students to use mixed uh, methods approaches, uh, looking at qualitative approaches as well as uh, quantitative approaches. And um, so uh, conducting both interviews, for instance, and also doing some observations and quantifying these observations, but uh, being able to uh, uh, navigate uh, between two worlds and, and being both um, uh, familiar with quantitative and, and qualitative approaches. Uh, that's uh, part of uh, the answer, I think. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to take this chance here to welcome in Bob. I think Bob is now joining us. Yeah, um, I'm here now. Hey, Bob. Thanks so much for, for joining Hi. us. And if you could just take a minute and just introduce yourself for those tuning in to listen. Yeah, so my name is Robert Shorten. Uh, I joined the school back in September, so I'm the new um, a professor of um, cyber physical systems design in the school. Um, before that, I was at, uh, I, I split my time roughly half and half between industry uh, and, uh, and university. So I worked for IBM research. I also worked for Mercedes research and I worked a number of universities in Ireland and, and, and elsewhere. And yeah, my background, I've done a, a mixture of things, but I'm, I'm really come from a, 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 a hardcore sort of control engineering uh, background. Great, thanks so much, Bob. Great to have you here. And um, so, just to just to loop you into some of the discussions that we've been having here, uh, you've been here for about a year, right? As you were saying. Yeah, a, li a little less. About half it's been in lockdown, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just since you've been here, I wonder if if the way you think about your own research has has changed at all since you've been in the design engineering department. Yeah, I mean, like I would have been used to, to designing uh, systems in the past, you know, uh, for for let's say for cars or 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 um, or, an, or, or, a, or a communications device that, and the my objective would have been to sort of design that system to work with other technical systems, and you know, more and more now we're starting to design algorithms, uh, components. To interact with humans, so that, so this idea of machine to human, machine to machine, other machine interaction is becoming uh, more and more important in society, 
And, um, you know, I, I think the coming to the department has sort of really crystallized and reinforced that view has been something that's very, very important going forward. So I think that's really the, 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 the ethos of design engineering where we're designing systems or artifacts that interact with, with humans. And I, I, I think that's a really exciting and, and in many ways sort of uncharted uh, re research area. So it's, it's, it's really exciting to be here. Great, thanks so much. I think, I think this leads in well to uh, a comment we have here from Tian Xiao, who says, how would you classify research that is human-centered? What does it constitute and what distinguishes it? Um, and, and, you know, I think maybe I'll, I'll comment on this uh, briefly, but I'd love to hear some other thoughts. And I think, I think some of the research that we do is human-centered, and by that we mean uh, maybe one easier, easy way for me to think about that is what isn't it? Um, so it isn't technology-centered, for instance. Um, so we're not trying to solve primarily a technical solution or a, a technical problem. We're trying to solve a problem that people have, um, and so we're focusing in on what is that problem and how do we really understand it in the context um, that, the, that the people have. Uh, but I don't think it's always about human-centered when we are dealing with people in the sense of what are their needs. I think sometimes it's also how do we interface with people? So, you know, it's not purely human-centered, or purely technologically centered or, or something else. Sometimes you have to jump between those because you're trying to solve human needs and you're trying to find out what's technically possible. Um, and I do think sometimes we have to uh, really balance several things going into this. And, and to me, that's what defines design engineering well. Uh, before, you know, before joining design engineering, uh, my original degree in training was as a mechanical engineer. And my frustration was that I thought we kept designing what I would call um, really interesting technical uh, outputs and, and sometimes products, but not solutions. And it's because we didn't have that more holistic approach to what was the human side of things. Any, anyone else on the panel have any specific thoughts on classifying research that is more human-centric. So I think, um, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Bob, let's come to you first. Okay, so what I was going to say was, I mean, I, I also used to think that it, it was, there were sort of two dimensions to it. You, you, want, you want to design something that is, you know, I'm a, I'm a technologist, so I would want to design something that was technolo technologically really nice, but also was, beautiful and people would want to use. But I think it's much richer than that. Like a lot of the the work that's going on now is it's not just about designing uh, systems for humans, but it's, it's also designing systems in, in a way that we project human values onto these systems and try and um, enable these systems to behave in a way that can be uh, understood and appreciated by humans. So, so the whole area is like, uh, bias in recommender systems, for example, you know, quite it, it, quite often because of GDPR regulations, you're not allowed to label things anymore. So the potential for bias to be introduced into algorithmic decision making is is huge. So so one of the problems there is that you, is that you, if you don't do something about that, you have machines making decisions that are that are discriminatory, and and that's uh, and that's a really important issue. The the issue of fairness, for example, the issue of equity, all needs to be rethought when we start to sort of replace traditional systems with more digitized versions of those systems. So I know Weston talks a lot about this, but the whole idea of ownership, I think, is really important. And, um, you know, everybody talks about privacy in the context of, of uh, digital systems, but actually identity and ownership and what even ownership means in the context of cyber physical systems, systems that have a real physical embodiment, but also have a digital side of themselves. What does ownership even mean in that context? I think these are really interesting and important research topics, but they're actually fundamental, uh, almost human rights type issues that uh, will emerge as we go forward. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great point. Uh, Celine and, and Nera, I want to come to both of you, but maybe we can start with Nera. I think you had a, a comment before. Uh, so just to reiterate, and I, I think uh, Bob actually touched upon it really beautifully now, but 
Um, so my obviously my own interest is is always sort of human and and primarily kind of mental health and well being um, in in a, um, any aspect of um, technology interaction and. Something that has been bugging me as a sort of non-engineer for years is that many systems are designed beautifully and they are lovely to look at and, and they work really well, but they will promote, for example, people overusing them or they might promote, you know, people, they might impact on people's sleep habits. They might interfere with young people's uh, social interactions as according to kind of expectations. And so... I'm, you know, really keen to do research. And I think that's why design engineering and, and Dyson School of Design Engineering is such a fantastic place. I'm keen to do research that, you know, thinks even longer ahead. And that's something that I notice when I talk to students and I talk to other researchers, that they're often really afraid because there's this argument that, well, we design it and we have the best intentions and you release it out into the world and then kind of good luck. Uh, and I think I, I don't I don't agree with that. I think some of the implications on physical or mental health can certainly be predicted. Not all of them, of course, but some can be predicted. And therefore, I think it's it's our duty to to try and think of these things and build it into the design system, design process, so that you know we might uh, remove ourselves from, for example, people overusing the products, or or we can build in. Uh, you know, certain stops into our system so that the people become aware of what they're doing, et cetera. That hasn't been done. And in fact, we are all living in a sort of massive attention economy. And and uh, what, what uh, Bob touched upon with these systems that, you know, survey everything that we do, but they're not necessarily uh, open. You know, these processes aren't necessarily open to us. So I think that's where design engineering specifically can absolutely have an impact. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And Celine, that's to you. Uh, yes, and I would like to add that design engineering is, uh, and the research we're doing on, on the process of designing is really key in uh, uh, having, uh, um, being able to uh, listen to users' voices and having uh, the users and, and, and citizens and, and communities more engaged in uh, the process of creating these innovations. and. Uh, so we um, mentioned earlier like biases. So perhaps uh, you have heard last week that a, a person was arrested in the US uh, because of a faulty facial recognition system. Uh, so this person was uh, African-American and it's known that facial recognition systems uh, are um, uh, gender and ethnic uh, biased, and because uh, partly because of the data that are that is used to develop the systems, but also because of the workforce in AI. Uh, so the workforce is uh, there is no diversity in the workforce, and I think design engineering can can um, uh, mitigate this in bringing the voice of the users into the process of creating these innovations. And uh, if we create tools and, and methods that can facilitate the conversation between uh, AI developers and, and uh, uh, startups and, and end users and, and especially uh, groups of underrepresented users, uh, I think we can uh, empower uh, citizens and, and, and give them more space in the innovation process. So to me, uh, design engineering research is actually a quite a powerful uh, political tool that would give more people to, uh, not only to imperial uh, engineers and scientists, but uh, to the whole world and, and people who will eventually use what is being created by uh, our engineers and scientists. Yeah, I think I think these are really good points. One one thing that I would just add, and and I think this was really strong in there and your comments was that we already change the world, right? When we put things out into it, and so when we think about things like specifically interacting with people, uh, then you know it's not a question of whether or not we will change the world, but can we justify that we're trying to make the world a better place, and and how are we going about doing that? Uh, Bob, I want to come to you. I think you have a comment. But Billy, um, just just before we go to Bob, I'm wondering if your work has been impacted at all by thinking more about people in the system. I know within your work specifically, you might not be doing human-centered design as, as we've been talking about it, but 
how does a consideration of people change how you think about your own work? Well, in terms of the research that we're trying to do in terms of uh, advanced technologies like electric vehicles, um, I think research and impact are inherently linked. We, we do uh, try and generate new knowledge for the betterment of society. And as we introduce new technologies, I think we have to be conscious of not just the positive benefits, but some of the side effects from the real world implementation, as Nera mentioned, um, just releasing a technology and letting it run wild is a dangerous thing. So as uh, electric vehicles, solar technology comes online, it is going to cause a reduction in other fields. So people losing jobs in maybe uh, the oil and gas industry, the coal industry. And I think uh, design engineering being a system of systems approach, we do need to consider um, the real world impact of how our technology gets used and how we can transition. And I think that word transition is important for real world uh, impact and implementation. Yeah, thank you so much. Bob, did you have a comment as well to add to this? Yeah, to echo what uh, Salim was uh, was saying, I, I think it's it's very important not just to think from a topic viewpoint of individuals, but also to think of the impact of what we're doing at a macroscopic level as well. Um, you know, just to give you an example of what I mean, um, you know, one of the, uh, one, you know, COVID has been absolutely terrible. It's decimated communities all over the world. But one of the things that it's really highlighted is uh, the issue of digital poverty. You know, the idea that some people have access to Wi-Fi and computers and smartphones and other people don't. And, you know, it, it, you know, even in Britain or, or Ireland, where I'm from, you know, you've got huge numbers of, of kids who can't participate in school lessons because they have no access to Wi-Fi. They have no access to, uh, to a computer. They might be sharing a computer with five or six people. And you really got to ask the question, like, what kind of society do we want to live in or what, how can we allow that to happen? And, and it shouldn't take COVID to really highlight these, uh, these issues. These are really you know, deep, profound societal issues. And I think part of the role of design engineering is to really highlight these poorly designed systems. You know, it shouldn't take COVID to highlight what is basically a, almost a human rights type. People should have access to education. So, so there are lots of examples like that, as you know, Weston, we've talked about a lot of them. Um, so I think, I think uh, design engineering really has a, has a, a very large place or a very large role to play in, in sort of thinking through some of the unintended consequences of not just how we design technology, but how we organize society as well. And of course that puts a lot of pressure on design engineering to, you know, in a lot of ways you're, you're being very uh, explicit about the impact we have on the world, right? And, and the change that we will make in the world or that we strive to make in the world. So it puts a lot of pressure to say, how do you justify the changes that that I think you are planning to make in the world? And you know, whose whose value system are you adhering to? And these are all questions that that of course we try to grapple with as well. Yeah, and it's not, it's not just about who the people, the, the stakeholder group that you will enable. It's also about the people that you leave behind. You know, you know, digital poverty doesn't just apply to people from poor, poorer backgrounds. It also applies to older people who will be left behind. For example, as we move more and more to an online world. Um, you know, that's that's just as big an issue. Yeah, so I think this this brings up an interesting point in terms of, of culture. Um, how, how do you infuse that type of thinking and that type of dialogue into a research culture like our department? And of course, you know, we've, we've been growing rapidly and so this culture has been shifting um, quite a bit year over year. Uh, but but I'm curious on, on thoughts on how do you start to embed that type of, of mentality into people's work. Uh, Billy, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, as a new department and startup, uh, we have a unique opportunity to do that. Um, I see there's a question from uh, Peter Mandano about like how we see research changing in the future. And I think, uh, as Bob mentioned before, uh, digital poverty, um, as the world changes, will become an emergent issue. And um, essentially, we need to make sure that as we progress and as science progresses, uh, we make it accessible to everyone, um, both uh, across uh, the world, but also, you know, in terms of the disciplines and the areas they work with. I think one of the unique aspects of design engineering 
is that um, hopefully we're building this uh, grassroots culture where um, I like to tell stories and um, Andy Brand, one of our colleagues before, when we were first starting the school, I asked Andy, it's like, as design engineers, what are we best at? So you've got electrical engineer who might be best at designing circuits, mechanical engineers who are best at doing mechanical testing. And he thought for a while and he said, they're good at handling ambiguity. And I had to think about that for a, a long time. But actually, I think that skill of handling ambiguity is really important because essentially as we progress into the world, there's gonna be challenges that we haven't seen before. And the students and the researchers we produce, they will be the world leaders in the future. And there will be degrees of risk where no one's done that before. So um, I think if we can uh, lead by example and show that just because it's not been done before doesn't mean it's not possible. I think that can really make a change in the world. Yeah, great. And, and Nera, to you. Yeah, so um, just uh, reflecting on that, actually, uh, one thing that I've noticed that is really interesting is so in psychology, there's this tradition of um, uh, running lots of lots of linear regressions and, you know, we collect data and, and hopefully it's normally distributed. And then obviously, whenever you collect data, there's always outliers, as they're called. Uh, from the so stats point of view. And what you would traditionally do is you might remove these outliers from your data because they don't help to tell the story that you want to tell, et cetera. And obviously from the design point of view, sometimes these are called edge cases or you know people who are not ne necessarily representative for the group that you're studying. And uh, I've found that you know in, in design engineering, there is for some reason a, a bigger focus on edge cases. And in fact, we're embracing the outliers, I think. Uh, just like Mike Montero wrote in his fantastic book, Ruined by Design, he was he was talking about instead of having empathy with people of a certain group or people of another gender, uh, hire those people and involve them in your work. And the beauty of our school is, I think, in its diversity. We have people from everywhere. Uh, we have people with research backgrounds from other places, not just necessarily different ethnicities, but but different types of research backgrounds. Uh, and I think that contributes to create this culture where we probably have a bigger focus on what's different than people might have in other departments. And then that's something that I think we should, of course, continue embracing, especially in, in, in this day and age. So, so this is this feeds well into a comment here from from Ellie Peatman. So, question for everyone: How do you think our school, the Dyson School, compares as an environment to do research in, given how diverse we are as a department? Uh, so, I think building on what you are saying, and I, and I think this is really important to consider, both from a staff perspective, but also from a maybe a PhD student perspective. Um, so, you know, if I if I just reflect a little bit on this. I think on a staff perspective, it's a delight, really. I think it's just so much fun to be challenged. And and I think we have, all of us have enough of a network beyond, you know, the people in the department that we really have some depth that we can tap into that, you know, if, if we need to go deeper into an area. So for me personally, it's a delight. My suspicion is as students, sometimes students aren't quite as ready to be branching out across disciplines as some of the members of staff, but I'm curious if if you share these thoughts. Celine, do you have any reflections on that? Um, well, I think first, uh, what, we're and what we're doing in the school is we're giving uh, like foundation skills to um, all the students and uh, there should be a, a very uh, robust uh, uh, foundation uh, for being able to um, to go beyond that and and uh, and explore further, uh, so it's like like children actually uh, they're curious, but at the same time they need some uh, core skills uh, to be uh, ready to go in the real world. Um, and um, so I think then it will uh, what we're bringing as um, research environment is the exposure to. Um, diversity and i think it's already a, a good start to be exposed to diversity and become aware that uh, there are differences in terms of disciplines uh, in terms of uh, research approaches uh, and also more generally in terms of uh, like human beings and different uh, um, uh, cultural um, values so well I've spent nearly a decade in Japan and it was a big shock to me when I joined the school uh, uh, well I 
I, I'm not saying I turn Japanese, but I'm I, I'm not as much uh, European as I was before. Um, and uh, so there's this uh, diversity, I think, in terms of um, behaviors as well, um, in terms of like uh, human behaviors that we have um, we have as just uh, individuals. Um, as um, in addition to differences in disciplines and um, and uh, academic backgrounds. So I think this exposure, uh, both for the students and for the staff, this exposure to diversity, I think is key to uh, uh, become aware of um, the diversity of people living in the world and the people whom we are designing for. So I think uh, we cannot bring the whole world and all potential users into the department, but at least we have kind of sample of, uh, of potential users that uh, makes us aware that um, people we are designing for are different from ourselves. Uh, Nera, yeah. Just a quick one. Sorry, I don't want to take up the discussion, but um, I love that Ellie's asking this question because I do think we ask a lot of both our undergraduate students and our PhD students, and indeed of ourselves, because multidisciplinary work, really multidisciplinary work, is hard. Um, and you know, if I teach psychology to our undergraduate students, I ask a lot from them because I'm asking them to step out of the comfort zone and reach into an area that they don't know anything about very likely and they feel very uncomfortable and my PhD students feel the same way they feel like they need to have one foot in one world and the other foot in the other world and that makes it more difficult than if they were say in a traditional psychology department but I also think that that's of course the the, the good side of that is that it teaches everyone how to think and I think the biggest thing we can teach our students and our PhD students and that we can learn ourselves is that education never stops expertise in one tiny little area is you know becoming obsolete and I think we all need to think outside of the box of what is you know our own science our own research and and start to embrace other ways of thinking and I think that's that's the solution for for real problem solving of the future so, so that brings me to another question, which is, you know, and, and we may have prospective PhD students who are tuning in now or, or who may watch this, but why, why would a PhD student necessarily come to design engineering instead of another department? Uh, Bob, do you have uh, any comments on this? Well, I think it depends on, I think it depends on what, what you're interested in, you know, um, so if you want to work on problems that you could, you know, I mean, if you want to use the term societal challenges, but if you're interested in societal problems, I think it's really good to be in, in a department that I would call hor horizontal department that spans, uh, that spans many different areas rather than a, a vertical department. Um, so, you know, if, if, if society and if societal challenges are what you're interested in and, and where you want to make a contribution, then I think it's, 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 it's really the right place to come. Um, but, you know, quite often, um, you know, the impediment to a new, te new technologies being deployed or being developed, it, it, quite often they're not technological, you know, so just to give you an example. So, you know, everybody talks about connected car now. But, you know, I worked in Mercedes research 25 years ago and, and everything that, that you see now in a car, we could have done 25 years ago. But the barrier was all the legal issues, all the issues around litigation, right? That's a uh, uh, deployment of things that can be really tricky. It was because nobody could figure out who was responsible if something went wrong. And, and and there are other examples, you know, um, if you look at examples like Uber, for example, and all of the issues around uh, driver's rights, you know, that's an example where the technology actually has gone ahead too quickly and left the legal aspects behind. You know, so some of the unintended consequences have been very, very poorly thought out. You know, there, there are two examples that involve legal issues, but th but there are other examples where, um, where, you know, to really sort of develop a system that is going to be useful for society, you need to... <laughs> A, a horizontal picture and I think more and more schools worldwide are are seeing that as being essential you know it's not just Dyson you've got Cornell Tech which is very similar in in New York you've got um you know many similar schools in Stanford for example um 
where they're really embracing this sort of horizontal picture of technology rather than a, a strictly vertical one. And, and do you see that as an area where truly disruptive research is taking place in these in these horizontal places or could take place in these horizontal places where people are maybe speaking at the boundaries of disciplines rather than within disciplines? I, I think you're better equipped to, to disrupt if you're if you're if you're in a place. Like that. Um, I mean, of course, there are disruptive technologies emerging from other places, you know, and ultimately it's down to the individual. But certainly. Being in an environment which which is broader, I think, is is more useful from seeing different perspectives and and seeing what the barriers actually might. Mm -hmm. And and Billy, you've spoken a lot about this being a startup department. You know, we're still we're not, we're not that old as a department, um, so a lot of things are still moving into place. How do you see that both as an advantage and and potentially something that some students might not want to engage with if they're uh, looking at doing a PhD? Um, it's a really good question because as uh, any startup there's a degree of risk but um, if you're also looking for leadership opportunities and also the ability to kind of uh, focus and shape the vision of the future I think um, we're a great place to do that. Uh, going back to your earlier point I think the advantage of design engineering as well is that we do tend to be quite applied and focus on real world problems um, and I think that's built into the degree, both in terms of the undergraduate with our six month placement, but also with a lot of the research that we do. And the two can be symbi uh, symbiotic. So to give you an example, one of the things that we've been looking at is energy access in developing countries. So essentially, we're quite lucky um, in uh, the West to have readily uh, access to electricity. But in a lot of places, that's not the case. So we've been looking at solar home systems where maybe you can collect solar energy, store in a battery and then basically power things like lights, which enable people to read in the evenings. And then beyond that, we've been looking at products like solar uh, fridges. So if you can store food and um, then that enables for several days, that enables you to um, improve quality of life. And in one of the projects that we did with our collaborators, there was an interesting insight that uh, the company that we worked with developed this solar fridge. And they realized that it wasn't selling very well. And after doing some user feedback, they found out that essentially it didn't look fridgy enough because essentially in those countries, having a fridge is a status symbol. So they want people to say, look at how great my fridge is. And that's an example of how we had the technological solution, but maybe the implementation with deeper user insight could have benefited and avoided that challenge. So I think that's quite an exciting blend of both the research, but also the human factors and industrial aspects of design engineering. And, and this feeds well into a, a question here from, from Michael Hoffman. He says, should design engineering align itself strongly with industry and commercialization of research, or is it better to serve to provoke and question industry? Um, can, can I just jump in yeah. here? Yeah. 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 Um, so um, coming from, again, traditional psychology, we'd like to think that we can stand on the side and, and feel very sanctimonious on the side of industry. Many psychologists would, would you know, ne they would never choose to work in industry because those who do, who deal with, for example, marketing psychology or orga organizational psychology, that's kind of seen as a little bit of a sellout or a lower status, you know, there's all these prejudices, obviously, that that are specific for for, for my subject. Um, I think, of course, we should be working with industry uh, because I think we can provide better solutions. That doesn't mean that, you know, I, I don't believe in move fast and break things as a mantra. I think disruption for the sake of disruption isn't necessarily productive, but I do think that uh, coming with insights you know, to make real changes and think about important outcomes, like Bob was saying, what kind of society do we want? What kind of structures do we want? You know, how do we want people to feel? That's where we can have a place to work with industry. So I think if we can have the autonomy and the uh, integrity to stand on the side and do our research and also align ourselves with what are some of the important questions, then that puts us in a, in a good spot. Yeah, I think great, great comment, Celine. Uh, yeah, I, um, perhaps the easiest answer is uh, both. <laughs> um, actually, we want to work with the industry. It's a kind of a validation of the work we're doing. But uh, at the same time, we 
as researchers, I don't think we have the same pace and we're kind of more agile than uh, companies, I would say. Uh, so we, we have the freedom uh, to and the agility to actually uh, set up our own agenda and, and lead the, uh, the research agenda, I think. So uh, I think it can be both and the best would be both. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, Billy and, and Bob, I know both of you have also done extensive work with, with industry. Any comments here? Maybe Billy, starting with you. Yeah, I, I think definitely we should be thinking about the research and what we're doing and what actually happens to it. And commercialization is definitely one route that we want to look at. Imperial aspirationally want to be the most innovative university in the world where we basically are shaping the agenda for the better. I think it goes back to Bob's point about what do we want the future to look like? And whilst research is useful, um, it's ultimately taking that, working with industry uh, or commercializing those approaches to actually realize all the impact that we write into these proposals. Um, because that's actually uh, personally why I get up in the morning and why I do what I do, because hopefully it will make an impact in the world. Uh, Bob, any, any final thoughts from you on this? Well, I think it's... Uh, being said it's a little bit of both but i think uh what's really important is that we challenge the narrative appropriate you know so we shouldn't be afraid to read the narrative and challenge it if we think it's wrong you know so to give you an example i know billy and i both worked on electric vehicles and you know there is a there is a narrative at the moment that electric vehicles will will solve all our problems you know uh, there are zero tailpipe emissions right but the but the issue with electric vehicles is they're heavier than traditional vehicles usually uh, and they have tires and tires wear and tires give rise to emissions right so that's an example where um where you know it's really important to challenge what's been said um you know electric vehicles are a very important part of a future solution but they are not the future solution and there are many other examples like that where we really need to challenge you know, because quite often people will jump on bandwagons and will will just accept what what, what they're being told. And, our, and our, our, our job as researchers is to really challenge and really convince ourselves of the utility of what is being proposed. Yeah. Just yeah. to follow on Bob's point, I always like to tell a good story and I think he's right that challenging the status quo is really important and our head of department, Peter Chung, uh, once told me, at Imperial we lead, we don't follow and I think that kind of mantra is uh, something that I think is, is useful to keep in our mind in terms of what are the things that we assume to be the status quo that actually can be challenged? Yes, thank you so much, and and a, and a great thought to to end on as our hour comes to a close. So this leaves it to me to um, thank everybody who's tuned in and the and the many comments that have come through. We haven't gotten to all of them, but thanks to those who made comments. It's really helped fuel a nice discussion and. Thank you to all the panelists who have made time and take time out of their lunch schedule to be with us today. Um, so I'll say goodbye to you here, but thank you so much. And just thank to everyone else who's still watching, this is part of the DE Summer Show uh, agenda and schedule. If you want to engage more, you can go to desummershow.london to learn more and tune in tomorrow. There's another symposium tomorrow at the same time um, that you can listen to as well. So thank you from all of us.